with the support of this conference and industry uh, partners, the Ken Kennedy Institute awards fellowships every year. In the la in, since 2001, we have awarded $1.3 million to 160,000 graduate students. The fellowships support the recruitment of um, outstanding graduate students to rise, as well as students pursuing research related to high performance computing, computational science, engineering, and data science. Finally, we hope that you will thoroughly enjoy this conference. Thank you for being here today. Now I'd like to turn it over to Charlie for our next event. Thanks, Angela. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank IBM for sponsoring this session. Without their support, events like this would not be possible. Um, the subject of our panel this afternoon is how computational science and new leadership HP system, HPC systems are changing science and engineering. We're privileged to have uh, some exceptional panelists today. Uh, these are David Kapchinski from uh, GE Research. He's the Chief Information Officer um, for Research. We have Pete Ungaro, Senior Vice President and General Manager of High Performance Computing and Mission Critical Systems at Hewlett Packard en Enterprise. And then finally, we also have Bronson Messer from uh, the Director of Science at Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility at Oak Ridge National Labs. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat throughout the session and they'll be added to our, our queue for questions. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pete, who's going to take our first question. And that question is, what project are you most excited about or proud about um, in the Exascale era? Oh, hey, that's a great question, Charlie, and thanks for having me here. I, I'm i most excited about building some gigantic exascale machines. Uh, you know, for us, it's super cool, right? We get to build a, a single system that's going to be both the fastest machine on the planet for modeling and simulation, but also the fastest machine on the planet for AI. And, and exascale really for us is about bringing a lot of different projects together. Uh, you know, if we think about... Uh, the three exascale systems and three pre-exascale systems that we're building overall, uh, it's going to push the boundaries of, of infrastructure, interconnect, storage, and, and for sure software uh, on these machines. And the six systems will have pretty much about every combination of CPU and GPU that you can almost imagine. Uh, and so really showing how heterogeneous computing is, is really driving the future. So uh, I, I am uh, super jazzed about being a, a part of putting these huge machines together and bringing them to, uh, to life. Thanks, Pete. So Bronson, on the receiving end of one of those big systems, what are you most excited about or, or what do you think people are gonna be most excited about with these new systems? Thanks a lot, Charlie. Uh, yeah, we are going to be one of the main customers for one of those big systems. Uh, you know, the, the first. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, I think we're pretty confident in. Um, I think the, the the real thing that we're excited about is what we're always excited about when we build a new platform, and that is the ability to do science with higher fidelity, with better results, with more realistic results, and to gain more insight from the work that we're doing. And we, I think we've at Oak Ridge, we've been uh, very much riding this this crest of hybrid CPU, GPU computing for a decade now. Uh, I think we're, dare I say, we're old hands at it. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's coming to the fore. We have a large community of users who can really make use of these machines at this point, and they're chomping at the bit to be able to get the maximum amount of power available to them. Something that Pete said about this fusion of, of AI and, and traditional modeling and simulation, I think is an important thing to note. In my mind, already the trends that we see at a bridge tells me that uh, these things aren't, that there may be distinct disciplines at this point, but they're really not separate things, right? That they're all becoming a single workflow that, you know, this, this synthesis is so something that, although we should pay attention to, it's not something we should worry about in as much as it's a fait accompli. It is already beginning to happen. It's already becoming part and parcel of scientific workflows to do both modeling and simulation and to do AI training and inference sort of together. 
And I think that that trend, I see every indication that that trend is going to continue into the near future and, and beyond. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, so what has been your, or what's your biggest concern or some lessons learned from your early access to these systems? Bronson? Yes. So uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, early parts and uh, early configurations for the, the kind of nodes that we're going to have on Frontier. Uh, you know, we, we have prosaic concerns, which concern the, uh, the applicability of certain programming models on the machine, right? We, we have been at Oak Ridge traditionally been using NVIDIA GPUs. Now we're moving to AMD GPUs. Thankfully, what we found is that the ability of even very high performing CUDA codes to switch to a, a, a compatibility layer like HIP has been very straightforward. We've been able to port codes it, on the order of two days, and that's the whole thing, right? Wow. We, we run a we run a sed like script on the on, on the code to to go through the code and make the ch make the simple changes, and then a human being does need to go in, and for the most part, needs to make modifications that are not completely necessary for the code to run, but are beneficial for future maintainability, right? And that sort of has taken you know on, on order of two days for most of the really high performing CUDA codes that we've already that we've already played with. So I don't so much I don't so much worry about that. I worry a little bit about um, moving to a, a new GPU platform where we're going to have a new set of of libraries available, a new set of frameworks available. Th there's going to be growing pains with that. We're going to have to, as a community, sort of figure out how we're going to replace some of the functionality that might have been vendor specific in the past, make it uh, more widely applicable to 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 all kinds of, of code bases. Uh, that's probably what keeps me up at night more than anything. It's not the hardware and it's not the base of the software. It's sort of the software ecosystem that goes around it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Hey, just to jump in on that, Charlie, too, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, and maybe more of a fact than just a concern, but, you know, refactoring legacy and developing new software. Um, and, and just to let you know, some of the biggest lessons learned we've had, and they've been the same with the ECP project, um, uh, at the U.S. government DOE uh, with the national labs is that um, more than just landing the technology, it's really the entire ecosystem around it and thinking of um, working on that ecosystem simultaneously. So instead of um, just landing it and then working on everything else, sim simultaneously working on the next generation software technologies, uh, the applications, the integrations, along with um, the hardware that, that's landing. That's a critical piece here and a big lesson learned um, to get really hitting the ground running once everything lands. So, so as long as we have your, uh, your focus, I was curious, what are some of the things that GE is really looking forward to um, exploiting in these exascale class systems? Well, when you think about exascale, um, we're always looking for more accurate models and faster turnaround times. So for us, exascale computing will help uh, our industry and really cross industry transform and unlock today's barriers. Today we face limitations. You know, how many calculations can we do and how fast can we do them? And today we really do simulation optimization, mostly at component and subsystem levels. Uh, with with uh, pre-exascale and now exascale coming, the goal is really to work on systems and ecosystems. You know, for us, um, it's going from just a set of gas turbine blades to um, an entire gas turbine. Um, in the case of even aviation, engines on wing in flight in, an, in its environment. But ultimately, we're working to drive better fuel performance um, while reducing emissions. So really getting to uh, both financial and environmental outcomes. You know, I asked some of our engineers here, you know, if, if you thought of Nirvana, with the next scale and generation of supercomputing, where, where would we get to? And, and it's the same answers. I'd really like to have a computer model of the entire gas turbine. I wanna hit a button, see it go, and simulate the whole thing at once. And, and we're just not there yet. And some of the pre-exascale systems are helping us to get there. You know, Summit is a great example. It allow, allows us to perform LES, little eddy simulations with extraordinary fast turnarounds where, we, where before we just weren't able to do that and enables to solve the underlying equations of motions with far less approximation than uh, we've ever done before. So that's just an example. We're looking for more accurate models and faster turnaround times. 
That's great. So next question I have here is, and, I, and I'll start with David. Um, what are your views on the cloud and how might elastic pricing impact the experimental process? So cloud computing for us is not new. And, and that may, may be an interesting point for everyone else. We've actually been running hybrid elastic cloud HPC uh, for more than five years now. And so we've grown that and it has specific point use. So I'm gonna say some things here that um, some people know, but, but maybe it'll help everyone out. HPC requires a highly reliable and stable computing infrastructure uh, from the start. And all HPC workloads run for long periods of time at extremely high utilization. And we, um, these, uh, these run times are persistent. Um, they really don't like to fluctuate and the demand um, is yielding a utilization that's much higher than the normal IT infrastructures that we use today. And we have to think about that when using cloud environments. Um, so when we think of cloud, we have to think of this consumption-based model, high utilization, persistent demand, and the long running of these workloads. And uh, so cloud makes sense uh, to us in, in the form of two um, fundamental use cases. One is non-persistent, occasional, and episodic demand where total utilization of compute and infrastructure would, would be lower. And the second case is for the occasion where we're willing to pay a premium to get results faster and maybe capture a market share or meet a customer deliverable. So we have this uh, huge spike in episodic demand that we can fill by spinning up cloud HPC and then spinning it back down. And in any case, um, we just have to look at, you know, the, the fundamentals of the cost structure and how that works into how we do our workloads. But uh, we have to think of those key pieces, you know, uh, the persistency, the high utilization and the demand on long running workloads. Just to, just just to reinforce that, Dave, you know, at, at Oak Ridge, we um, summit the, the nation's largest supercomputer regularly has utilizations well above 90 percent just absolutely constantly uh the, the the machine is pegged absolutely to the wall and we have a ton of pent-up demand behind that as well uh, i think that uh, you, you you articulated the the needs and the and the, the considerations really really well at the same time we also accommodate as part of our part of our working model the ability to have sort of episodic huge bursty bursts of, of activity on the machine that of course does come at the cost of utilization, but we try to get both of those those workload types, you know, on our on-prem resource, if you will, uh, and and I think we've been fairly successful with that because it is it, it, that it is a place where actually just sheer scale helps because you can continue some of the workload even while you're draining the machine for for something really big. So uh, that that's one of there's a there's other there are other things where sheer scale helps. Uh, and it's not just, you know, about having the, the very biggest plop of machine that we have on the floor and, and thinking that it looks cool and it's nice to say that we're the fastest and the biggest, but that actually provides real value to being able to get more science done. That's great. Um, I'm curious if Pete has any thoughts on uh, cloud and its uh, use in the HPC workloads. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, do. I, I, I love what David said. I think that that makes total sense to me. And that's the way that we're starting to see people think about it. When I when I think about cloud, I think about, you know, access, I think about kind of the the economics of it. And then I think about the architecture, right. And I more and more now, we're working on the access uh, advantages. So I, I think, you know, when cloud started, there are a lot of advantages to getting on the cloud, kind of the user environment and, and such that was available there. Uh, with all of the work that we've been doing in software and capabilities, I, I think we've really made the access point less of a differentiator. I think you can do the same types of things in uh, a private cloud as you can do in the public cloud. Uh, I think similarly in the economics, David mentioned, you know, utilization rates have a big, uh, you know, if you have low utilization of systems, you know, you're going to get probably better economics in the cloud. If you have higher utilization rates, not e even not even close to what Bronson just mentioned, but it, you, you, you're going to have better economics 
uh, by by owning and and we've done a lot of work like with HPE with GreenLake. Uh, we now can have all the flexible pricing and stuff. So if you wanted to do that type of a uh, of an environment, we can do that on prem, off prem, in the cloud. However, you want to do that. I th I think the key still though is the architecture piece. And David kind of leaned on that a little bit. Uh, I I think you can you know having really tightly coupled systems to do these models that are you know that we have to keep all together that are long running that especially communication intensive ones i think need a system that's a different architecture and typically you're not finding that in the cloud there is some projects like for instance we have a we have a cray supercomputer up in azure right and and so i think you'll see some projects like that to try to bridge the architecture gap but uh, but today the architecture of systems that you know we're building on prem in a in a supercomputing world is quite different than what you can get in the cloud and and so I think what you're going to see is is based on application demands um, more communications demands and such I think you'll see more of a tighter integrated graded architecture and uh, and then you know more computational where you don't have a lot of communications where you don't have maybe um, a, a lot of long running jobs or jobs that, that are running across large and large number of, of processors at the same time, you may see those start to migrate to the cloud. So I think we'll see that uh, the world's gonna be hybrid. I mean, so uh, so it's like, how do you use each piece to fit you know, your, your overall workload? And, uh, and I think that's the key for data center managers and CIOs going forward. So we have a question from the from the audience, um, and this one's directed towards David from VJ Pratap, and his question is, what is your experience running very large batch jobs, close to 700 to 1,000 nodes on a cloud environment? Well, I'm going to actually go back and answering one of the first questions and answering that one, which is uh, okay. what are some of the projects that we're excited about and proud of? And okay. it's in this energy space, um, it's a renewables project. I had two to talk about today. One was around power generation and our 7HA world-class gas turbines. But for this answer, I'm going to talk about our renewable um, uh, offshore wind farms. And I'm going to give two examples here. One is the work <clears throat> that we recently did here, uh, G Research with Oak Ridge and our lead researcher, uh, Jing Li. We focused on low low-level coastal jets, which are difficult to harness. Um, this was to understand how we could produce more energy from turbines in just the right manner and not overloading them. We want to boost their reliability, curb their maintenance costs, um, and, and really uh, help with the shift toward more renewable energies. But uh, today, when our computational scientists build models uh, based on physics, we typically have to limit um, the, num the numerical complexity to what can be pragmatically run on available computing systems. So traditionally, we do different models um, at small scales, and then we begin to integrate many models across larger scales, which then lead us to the, the demand for supercomputing. And really, ultimately, to this question, how can we do large-scale batch jobs? So in this case, um, you know, grappling with the interactions of uh, the physics here, um, we really needed to work on this at the level of not just a turbine blade or a single wind turbine. We needed to work on it in the uh, context of an entire wind farm, which means modeling the airflows in both finer detail, but massive scale and across an entire wind farm. And then the calculations are so complex that each individual wind turbine further uh, kind of disturbs even the, the aerodynamics. So with, with supercomputing, we're able to do these large scale batch jobs. We've done them in two ways. One was with this work that we did with Oak Ridge um, on Summit, incidentally. And then we've also replicated this and we've done it in what we were just talking about in a uh, hybrid elastic cloud supercomputing environment. And, um, and by the way, the level of batch jobs that we've done are not just in the order of uh, hundreds or thousands. We've actually, if we look at the number of jobs we've done on an annual basis, are actually in the millions. So that may be an interesting answer to you. Can we run those very large batch jobs in cloud environment? And the answer is yes. 
Can we also do the same large batch jobs on very large supercomputing environments? The answer is also yes. And um, kind of like we were just discussing. Hopefully that all helps to answer your question. That's fantastic. So there's a, a question in here. I think this kind of is building on maybe the, um, the exascale environment where we have these massive systems that we're building. And do you have any suggestions on how we can make uh, hardware more sustainable? So uh, I, I think there's a zero to order answer to that, that uh, at Oak Ridge, we're very concerned with this because, you know, we have, at this point, we have 40 megawatts of power coming into our into our data facility, uh, which is a, a ridiculous hyperbolic number. So if we want to be able to um, have a sustain, if we want to be able to to do things sustainably, the first, the first task is to be able to measure exactly the power draw that we have. We need to understand how uh, applications running on the machine actually draw electricity and what the load is at any given point. And, is, and then, then we can ask questions about trying to um, limit power to certain parts of the machine if they're not needed, scheduling things in off-peak hours so that we can, for example, take, take advantage of more renewable energy sources, all those kind of things. But they all come first and foremost from having an understanding of what the power profile of our workload actually is. And we work very hard at that. Uh, we have uh, a, a lot of instrumentation and a lot of uh, and and a lot of bodies actually working on exactly this problem at Oak Ridge, for example. Yeah, if I could nice. jump in on that, Charlie, I, maybe just two more things I'd add to what Bronson just said, which is, you know, I think one of the things that we get into is some of the measurements that we use for like PUE and things don't measure kind of the end to end power problem as Bronson was talking about and, and can give you kind of a bad view, a, not, not a very, a, a, it's not bad, but it's just not very accurate view of what's really going on there. Um, and so I, I just would add that. And then the second thing I'd add is I, I think the more we can get out of each processor each you know memory dim the more performance and capability we can drive we actually are much more power efficient the the best way to improve power efficiency of a system is if you can move from being you know uh having three percent of the of the peak performance of the machine to six percent of the peak performance of the machine that dwarfs anything else that you can do in the whole power cycle right you know and so really working on the, the compilers and tools and libraries. And this is a big, big focus of ours to try and get the most that you possibly can. Ha having networks that move data around and keep the processors fed with data as much as you can. You know, anything you can do to drive that utilization and that, that throughput up really helps in the back end on, you know, if you're thinking of, of, of you know, watts per, uh, per calculation or however you want to think about it. Those are the big drivers right now because everybody's pretty smart about putting machines together and doing liquid cooling and everything. And and by the way, I think liquid cooling is going to be huge uh, because just the wattage of the future parts that we're seeing in roadmaps over the next five years are like 10x what we're seeing today. And so when you can't even air cool a single node, uh, you will see <laughs> you will quickly move to liquid cooling. You have no choice. Uh, to have any kind of density in your in in your uh, center. Just to comment on Pete's point about efficiency, absolutely spot on. I, I totally agree. There's also something incumbent upon software developers in that regard, right? Because it it still takes a lot of energy to to move a piece of data from memory into a register. It it takes a lot more energy to do that than actually to operate on it in a lot of cases, and so having good ways to do memory placement, memory movement, and to make effective use of the memory hierarchy on modern devices is key to making sure that we're as green as possible. It also has the added benefit that it just flat out reduces your time to solution. And we see that across platforms. So it's it's a win-win in that situation. It, it takes human effort, but uh, it's, it's flat out the way to go. All right, well, I'm gonna ping pong with Bronis on this one. So I, I think when you think about the memory, especially because uh, as as we know, what, whether it's, you know, it's some of the calculations David talked about, uh, Charlie, what you guys are doing in Seismic, 
uh, work and stuff. The memory subsystem is absolutely huge. I, I think high bandwidth memory is going to have a major effect uh, in this area along the line with what Bronson talked about. And we're going to have to figure out how can we take advantage. I think we all know how we can take advantage of a faster memory, but also a smaller memory. And that's mm -hmm. going to be a challenge. And, that, and that's what we're going to have to think about. And then sharing that memory across the heterogeneous computing elements, whether that's a CPU, a GPU, even maybe in some cases an FPGA or other uh, other accelerators, right? I think it's going to be a huge thing. It's the complexity of the memory hierarchy, yeah, and, and being able to manage it effectively. Mm -hmm. So, Pete, I'm just going to jump in and totally agree too. Like, and you mentioned it earlier on architecture. You know, the the um, all of our new computing environments, whether they're hybrid or heterogeneous, the architecture is is not just uh, standalone anymore. You know, example is this next generation um, national lab supercomputing, heterogeneous CPU, GPU, large data pipe architecture. And um, you know that that's a key enabler here. Maybe maybe even a stepping function here into some of the other questions I see in the chat here on um, ML and AI. You know where where are our supercomputing environments going in the enablement, and can we do um, machine learning and AI on these environments? And um, and the answer is yes to that as well. Right. So building on the memory architecture theme, we have a question from the audience. Uh, so how how do we um, how do we see new memory architectures that favor non contiguous or sparse memory access to support stencil computations? As you know, that's a big workload in, in oil and gas. Um, we can start with Pete. Yeah, um, you know, so <laughs> maybe I'm the wrong person to start with with this question. I, I, I would probably uh, bow to the other guys on this one, but I, I would just tell you, I think the, um, the, the way that I think about it from a perspective of, of the memory hierarchy is that we're not leveraging the, the, the total memory hierarchy today. And, and we're, we're, you know, the programming models that we're using are assumed, most of them, are assuming a relatively simplistic view of what is gonna become an extremely complex memory hierarchy soon, not just uh, not just on the silicon, but in high bandwidth memory, you have DIMMs, you have fabric attached memory, that's gonna become you know, very important over time. We're seeing a lot of uh, you know, potential use cases for this. And so I really think about how do we look at the programming models in respect to these, you know, deepening memory hierarchies? What is too deep? You know, I think is another question because I think it's sometimes uh, as as uh, our computer architects uh, could talk about how we could build these very very deep hierarchies, and our application teams, uh, you know, will run out of the room screaming, telling them that they're crazy because it's just too hard to use. And so I think that there's a balance there between what's technically possible and what makes sense for an application programmer because these machines are used there's not just five people that get to use these machines right these are very very broadly used machines and and more and more what you're going to see and one of the big focuses that we have at hpe is how do we take all of this very advanced technology that's going into like the exascale machines how do we get that into somebody that just needs a single cabinet or even a single server, but they don't want, they they need that same technology because like David was saying earlier, they have the same problems. Um, so why, why do they have to step back in the technology? And so big focus of ours is taking these exascale technologies and, and being able to deploy them in single, you know, single cabinet or even single server environments for smaller users or developers or things like that. Great. Thank you, Peter. So next question we're going to go to is from uh, Miguel Tampos, and he has a question for Bronson. So his question is, will you be using containers and Kubernetes for compute loads or just AI and ML op operations at Oak Ridge? Um, that's that's a pretty easy question to answer. Yeah, we're going to be using containers for, for everything that needs software management that, that, a, that containers can, can, can bring about. Uh, the, the most obvious, most proximate target, of course, is AI workflows that, that have deep dependencies that, that we need to manage. 
but uh, especially on Frontier, we're going to have containers, I think, all over the place, uh, no matter no matter what the, the ultimate um, the ultimate focus of the, the workload is where it's going to be a ubiquitous feature of, of what we do. And furthermore, it's going to be a ubiquitous feature of the entire workflow. It won't just be, you know, this certain group of users uh, uses containers. I anticipate that that users who are quote unquote traditional modeling and simulation will also make use of containers, perhaps not for the simulations run itself. Let's call that the data generator, but certainly for the portion of their workflow where they're going to be trying to glean insight from what they actually just computed. Um, so yeah, the, the, the short answer is, yeah, the containers will be a ubiquitous feature on the next generation of exascale machines. I'll jump in and say yes to that one too. Um, you know, we, we actually have an example that um, we're, we're a bit public with, but we did a recent automation around workflows uh, combined with machine learning. We call it digital thread for design. It's focused for our engineering community on um, automating their design processes and um, and really incorporating the entire design process from the computer-aided design and computer-aided engineering, so modeling and simulation uh, together. Automating the workflows, uh, we're obviously leveraging uh, containerization and Kubernetes um, with the abilities to do that. And um, and by doing this, and by the way, this is focused on our power generation products, or aviation products, renewable products. Um, we want to discover um, early on performance levers, trade-offs, and contradictions in early design iterations. And by doing that, we can um, we can also significantly re reduce the tedious uh, labor elements by automating a number of the workflows. And what we're finding from this is. Um, we're finding more design options can be explored by uh, automating and integrating these uh, process and work elements. And then um, we're also introducing it as part of the machine learning and machine learning libraries surrogate models. So uh, we pulled in all of our former models and we're creating new, new models called surrogates that we're entering into the machine learning libraries. And they're created as part of this automated tool chain. And then what that's doing for the for us is we're able to do uh, quicker uh, analysis and iteration cycles. So we're able to perform some main effects analysis of performance factors, some sensitivity and insensitivity to design choices. And then um, ultimately here we're creating our future um, digital repositories of these analyses. And then, um, and then we're reusing those as part of our future machine learning and training libraries. So um, I just wanted to kind of give a, an example of how that's being used in uh, practical application. Yeah, I, I would also say we're, we're seeing this broadly uh, across the industry and, and people are, are using it for also code maintainability, I, I think in, in you know, workflow maintainability, but also portability because um, not everybody's as lucky as Bronson and has a big mammoth machine at their in, in, at their uh, at their use, and so they're developing. And and even I think Bronson, you'd say even at, at Oak Ridge, you know, people are developing on different machines. They're testing out different data sets on different machines, so that when they get their shots on the big machine, they are as you know they are as ready for that, and they can make as maximum you know usage of that. And so by, by containerizing things, we're seeing more and more people being able to put workloads in different places. David gave a great example of being able to move from on-prem machines up into the public cloud and such. You know, that container is going to make that so much easier. So we're seeing this, uh, of course, you know, obviously in the AI space, that's it's a huge thing. But we're seeing it with modeling and simulation customers that, that want to do this with their, their models and workflow, kind of a, as, as David and Bronson were mentioning. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, uh, for us, because we do have the huge machine, we have to, at the end, we need to compute the whole calculus, right? Where, it, where, where do we, are we getting maximum performance from containerization? Do we need to do some things differently? But that's sort of the last step, as, as Pete's saying, once we get it, once we get the workflow sort of working, ready, developed, then we can start sort of start that second order iteration to try to figure out, uh, do we really want to go forward with this? So it's not just containerization, you know, to be buzzword compliant, it's actually what makes sense from the beginning of the development cycle to the end. That's great. Thank you, Bronson. So we have another question here from Keith Gray. Um, and 
I think we have the benefit of having three different perspectives on this, this question, and it's how do you demonstrate value from HPC and how do you justify these big investments? And so I think we'll start with industry first with uh, David. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. I'm going to tie in a form example too, but um, ultimately for us, it's, it's outcomes. So um, we're obviously leveraging modeling and simulation for the purposes of analysis and optimization of our products. We're, we're developing our products with high performance computing. So our uh, products have measurable outcomes, performance cycle, how fast we can do the product development cycle, even manufacturing cycle, uh, ultimately cost. You know, we think in terms of mass, mass is materials, uh, material optimization is cost, quality and service lifing. So service lifing, including reliability, durability. Um, and then just to kind of um, hone in on one particular one around cycle and product development <clears throat> ties back to that digital thread for design and design automation, really tying early product virtualization of, of a product with uh, computer-aided engineering, analysis, simulation, optimization, tying the two together, automating the entire tool chain. So uh, an example would be, in most cases, we would probably only iterate a component or a subsystem maybe two to ten times um, in the development of a new product introduction. We call it an NPI. Um, and that two to ten times takes some time in order to do that. It could take months, it could take a year and a half in order to do two to 10 major um, iterations of that design. Um, and what we found by automating the tool chain is that we take in some cases a component design that took uh, three to six months to do those two to 10 design iterations. And we were able to do over a million design iterations in less than 15 minutes. Now the question from maybe you, the audience would be, in the million or more design iterations, was there a subset, you know, uh, one or less than 10 that far outperformed the uh, component designs or subsystem designs that you have done in the past? And the answer to that was yes, in fact. So um, that's really the road that we're going down, which is how do we justify doing high performance computing in an industry environment and um, those measurable outcomes is how we justify our spend um, by severely compressing the product development cycle, being able to go faster to market, and then being able to produce um, components or subsystems that are far superior to anything that we have done in the past. Excellent. So let's, let's take a, a National Labs perspective and we'll go to Bronson and get his thoughts on this question. Well, for, for us, I think it's a fairly straightforward answer. What we're doing with these platforms is we're enabling scientific inquiry that cannot be enabled any other way, right? We're either talking about scientific uh, regimes that cannot be reached through terrestrial experiment, cannot be reached through observational science, whether it be po pointing a telescope up at the sky or, or pointing it down at the ground and trying to figure out things like uh, biodiversity and, and, and things like that. Right. There are there there remains a huge raft of scientific questions across domains that simply cannot be answered without large scale computation. The, the problems are both posed in that language and they will be answered in that language to be sure to, to be doing science rather than just playing a video game. We have to connect directly to experiment and observation, but the questions of how and why are really the questions that we're, we're dedicated uh, to trying to find out that that now that extends to the kind of engineering development life cycle that Dave was talking about it, all the way to doing large scale structure formation in, in the universe simulations. There's simply no other way to get at the answer. Furthermore, I would say that we have sort of an inverse problem to to a lot of AI and ML and DL problems that are in, really in vogue right now where folks are looking for correlations in data, correlations in signals, and they want to be able to pose questions based on that in inquiry. That happens a little bit at the very highest end of HPC, but for the most part, we sort of know the questions. It's the answers that we're looking for. They'll lead to a new set of, of, of questions down the line, but that's the incremental nature of science. So I, I would say it's, it's pretty much existential 
for a lot of domains and a lot of particular domains that are at the forefront of the most exciting um, parts of science and engineering right now that, that are enabled by the very highest end of HPC. Great. Thank you, Bronson. So I'm going to go to Pete, and, and this time I'm going to take his, his perspective on what are some of the more challenging or difficult um, value um, problems that you've you've encountered when working with your customers yeah that's a that's a great view of it you know it's uh it's interesting because you know everybody's different right and everybody's trying to do different things but you know from our perspective what we've really seen is is both from a growth of data you know and just the just natural growth of data that's been happening that is not going to stop in our <laughs> at least in my lifetime i can't imagine uh but that's driving you know different you know different ways to think about this and also you know as we've as we've gotten better on the algorithm side that's really changed the way that people think about this value i you know if i could use an example from uh from your space charlie i mean moving from you know rtm to fwi it has just been a huge shift in how people think about you know what do they need and what's the value of these calculations and it is starting to to make people think about it in you know in different ways so uh, i think that there's, there's so many different you know areas that we could talk about from um you know formula one racing where it's really very very time dependent and they're doing things you know or weather forecasting in extreme weather events where it's very time dependent to where as david said in industry you know it's a lot more around roi and how do we think about you know the the benefit of the new product development and that cycle and how do we speed that cycle up uh to as bronson saying you know kind of answering these big questions that you just can't get at any other way so it's uh it's a I don't know. This makes it, from my perspective, this is what makes it fun. Uh, this is what makes this industry really exciting and and a place that I just love because uh, you get to see kind of these different angles and all using needing to use very similar tools, but to to use them in very different ways for very different you know applications. Hey Peter, I was going to springboard on yours, and I saw a thoughtful question from Fernando Fortier on. Um, you know, I, I get it. It's how you're how you're using the systems, but how are we fundamentally changing science and engineering? And you know, one one thought that I had in answer to that was, um, you know, the the newest generation of supercomputers um, on prem or or in cloud, they're enabling us to solve uh, the underlying equations with far less approximations than we've done before. You know, in, in the past, there have been underlying approximations. We're trying to get as close to reality as possible. And that goes for not just the product engineering and science that we're doing in industry, but um, you know, the, the natural physics and science that, that go across um, everything. And we're now solving these engineering and scientific physics with hardly any approximations at all in some cases. So in effect, we're, we're actually reaching a point now, unlike before, where we're able through com computational um, methods and supercomputing to get closer and closer to reality um, through computation. And I think that's going to have profound effects in many areas. Um, you know, think about uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Um, if you've read anything on um, virtual and silico, I mean, the idea here is that we can uh, virtually test uh, chemicals and compounds um, virtually uh, as opposed to physically. Um, and, and once again, also speeding up those cycles, we're, we're able to uh, find and um, identify uh, potential compounds and fixes to things that um, we, we were never able to find before unless we tested physically. And um, that's gonna have profound effects going forward. Let's pivot to Bronson on that same question. Oh yeah, so let's, thanks, that was a great setup. So. Something I want to uh, that, that is sometimes lost when we're talking about the very highest end of HPC you know, Summit, for example. I, I always say that Summit uh, has uh, a lot more similarities to the Hubble Space Telescope or the Large Hadron Collider than it does to your desktop, in as much as it's a unique scientific instrument. And it goes to what David was talking about when it comes to physical fidelity. 
the, the, the level of physical fidelity that we can already reach at the pre exascale and that we're going to be able to achieve at the exascale is, is the, is the kind of, is the level of physical fidelity and the lack of approximation that we've basically been looking for, for at least, I would say, half of the total lifespan of computational science. If we sort of define this, uh, define that as the mid 40s, as back in the mid 40s, sort of for half of that whole time, entire life, life cycle, we sort of known and understood the level of approximation that we're dealing with in many scientific endeavors, and that we're going to be able to supersede them, right? So that is, that is uh, in many ways, not an inflection point, I would say, right? It's just the incremental uh, nature of science. But the fact that they're sort of all going to come together at, at one time, roughly, that in itself is perhaps indeed an inflection point. And add to that, that we have now also enough computational horsepower to be able to do training inference through ML and DL to be able to glean more human understanding out of this lack of approximation that we have. It really is a confluence of a couple of different met, uh, methodologies of human inquiry that I think might be unique in the history of computational science. At least it's, it's looking like it has the possibility of being that. Great. So uh, I'm curious if, if Pete has any thoughts on that same question. Uh, I'm not going to add anything to okay. what David and Bronson said on that. It just makes me excited to think about, you know, the, the capabilities of these machines and, and that it can have that impact uh, overall, which is which is super exciting. It's, it seems like a, a build on what David was saying was that not only are we able to achieve greater fidelity and, and um, fewer approximations, but we're also able to run multiple scenarios and, and parametric studies. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I mean, that, that, that's what science is, right? I mean, science is not doing one-off instantiations of a set of ideas. It's not doing a single experiment. Science actually is trying to understand the nature of a thing by twisting the knobs, if, if you will, right? And absolutely parametric evaluations of things that still have to be parameterized, not, not because of computational limitations perhaps, but in fact, limits in theory, right? That our understanding only goes so deep and that we have to parameterize some of our understanding before we can even at, start asking the same, the, the new set of questions um, is absolutely essential to actually do science. Uh, One-off one -off calculations uh, are, are often good for demonstrating the power of a technique, uh, but they're, they're never a, 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 um, a replacement for actually doing science in that mode. I would just add that we're seeing more and more customers uh, in, in, in a much broader set of disciplines, you know, using ensembles, for instance, to do exactly what Bronson just said, uh, or stochastics, you know, that we just hadn't seen before. And a huge part of that is just they're getting more and more enabled by the capabilities of these systems and understanding how to take advantage of them and use them, that they're able to do that. And uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of had this interesting effect of getting to better answers, which helps them to, to be more confident in using computational tools to get to those answers. Therefore, they start using them more. And it just becomes a really interesting cycle that we see. Well, that's, that's awesome. I really appreciate the, the time that you guys have taken with, uh, with our audience. Um, your unique perspectives have added a lot of value to the conference. Um, and so, you know, as we uh, close out this session, a couple of things I wanted to, uh, to remind folks are, um, the pr if you missed any of the presentations that have happened during the conference, they will be uploaded to, to Brella shortly after the talks. Um, please be sure to log on to Brella at least once before next Friday to ensure that you have access. Most of the presentations will be available for a year um, from this conference. Um, and then also that we're going to be having a virtual networking reception in this Remo platform at 345 this afternoon. So um, this will be a great opportunity for you to interact with other 
participants and presenters in the in the conference. Please take advantage of that. And I really want you know once again, I want to thank each one of you for taking the time to meet with us and sharing your thoughts on this important uh, part of our uh, exciting part of the X scale era. So thanks again. So.